Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, HR Roundtable, Building Resilience. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm PJ Trudeau. And this is a topic I think where all of us could definitely do uh, with always finding out some additional tips and tricks and things that we could be doing uh, to really help build our resilience in everything that we're doing, especially in the field that we're in from an HR perspective. Uh, today, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our wonderful consultant that's going to be providing us just all of this great information. Emily Hurd is a high performance coach for high achieving professionals in high stress careers. She wholeheartedly believes that your well being does not need to be sacrificed in the name of career success. In fact, she helps clients and organizations bridge the gap between personal wellness and professional success. Her over 15 plus years of hybrid coaching. Uh, and counseling experience has helped thousands of clients improve the quality of their lives. Her approaches are grounded in psychology, neuroscience, and the science of well being. Emily also brings 15 years of leadership experience to her work, having served in management roles with multiple corporations before founding and growing her own businesses. She has sold one of her businesses and now focuses all of her time and energy on Vantage View Consulting, helping people strengthen their mental fitness so they can thrive in their career and in life. Emily, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, PJ, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited to talk about this topic and give you all some tools and strategies for you to build your own individual resilience and then potentially bring it back to your organization or your teams to help your your employees build their resilience too. Um, I am very familiar with with being in the role that all of you are in the position of the caretaker for other people. Um, you know you are the you are the go-to in the organization to solve problems and help people through difficult times. And as a previous counselor and therapist, I certainly have a, a deep understanding and appreciation of just how much of a toll that role can take on people and the, um, the skills that we need to have, that you need to have in order to be there and perform your job well and not let it kind of overtake your life and lead to burnout or lead to um, kind of exhaustion in, in your job. Um, so I'm excited to, to share some strategies today. Um, I will ask you to type in the chat at certain times, um, answer questions. I want to make this a little bit interactive. Uh, so I am looking forward to hearing from you all as well. So when we talk about this concept of resilience, it is, it's a buzzword out there right now in the post-COVID world. Uh, PJ and I were talking prior to opening up the, the presentation about it, the, the fact that the, the traumatic event, the shared trauma that we all went through, has opened everyone's eyes to just the need to take care of our mental health, our mental fitness, our physical health, and the importance of the, the preciousness of life. And as people are coming out of the pandemic and we're recovering, I, I think that there is a hunger, there is a desire to have more skills and tools and strategies in our toolbox to be able to cope with major events such as a pandemic or just other events, major events that go on all over the world every day and then in our individual lives as well. There, there are a lot of stressors on a daily basis and sometimes it can feel really overwhelming to even know how to, to start coping with it all. Um, and so that is exactly what the psychological skills of resilience teach you to do and allow you to do. It is really, it's from the Latin verb resiliere, and I did not take Latin in high school, so if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, please forgive me, um, but essentially the, the definition is to leap back. So how do individuals leap back from or bounce back from adversity? How do they react to difficult events in life? There's this quote by Nelson Mandela, do not judge me by my successes, judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. 
Um, so, you know, sometimes when I think of resilience, I, I am, um, I do a lot of sports psychology. And so when I think of resilience, I think of that boxer who's in the seventh round and has really taken a pummeling and they have to get back up in round number eight and continue fighting. So what I'm, I'm interested to hear from you in the chat, what characteristics come to your mind when you think of a very resilient person, either that you know personally or someone out in the, the uh, public sphere that, that you perceive that they have high levels of resilience? Adaptable, great. Yep, maintains a positive attitude. They don't give up. They have a lot of perseverance. They're determined. Mm, Amelia, that's a that is a good one. Um, they know when they need to take a break. Confident. They have self care. Patience. That's a good one. When we when we are drained energy wise, then we can be a little bit more irritable and a little bit less patient. So those are those are all great characteristics. Thank you for sharing those and some of those we will be talking about today. Now resilience is not just something that applies to the individual. We all want to have individual levels of resilience, high levels of individual resilience, but it also spans across different um, systems and collections of people. Companies have different levels of resilience. When we look at companies that are successful for 50 years, 100 years, they have a high level of resilience. They're able to adapt and change and continue moving forward versus those that don't make it or they have to shut down after five years or 10 years. Um, sports teams have levels of resilience. Do, do basketball teams in the middle of the season, if they have a losing record, just kind of throw their hands up in the air and throw the towels in because they know that they're not gonna make it to the NCAA tournament? No, they continue putting in their best effort every single play, every single game. The military. They have to have high levels of resilience and commitment and perseverance and dedication to the missions, even if they take years and years and years. Um, whoops, I was trying to move the, the chat box here. Um, cities and communities. You know, I have a picture of a hurricane here because that is natural disasters are an example of preparedness and readiness of a community for events that they know that there's a high potential of happening, the event happens and then how quickly can that community bounce back from that event. Um, countries and then systems, for example, computing systems or software systems, how resilient are your security systems to potential cyber attacks uh, and the kind of constant stress on the system. So when we think about resilience, it, it goes all the way from the individual to the collective. And then there are positive health outcomes with resilience. It, it is not just a, a mental thing. It actually is tied to our physical health as well, which makes sense because our mind and body are connected. So people with higher levels of resilience, they have more positive emotions, they're able to better regulate their negative emotions. It's not that we don't want them to have negative emotions. Negative emotions are a, a natural, normal part of life, but it's how do they handle those when they come up? Um, people with high levels of resilience are less depressed. They navigate aging more successfully despite physical health challenges that come along with that time of life. Um, higher levels of resilience have been associated with better recovery after injuries or after uh, traumatic events and PTSD symptoms. Our immune systems are stronger when we have higher levels of resilience. Important for you and your companies and organizations, there's lower absence rates from work due to sickness or due to mental health issues when people are more resilient. And then overall, there's a lower rate of mortality and a greater higher level of physical health. 
So this is, this is not just about showing up at your job and doing the best that you can every day. It really is tied to your overall quality of life. So how can we boost resilience? Well, it is the, the repetitive practice of psychological skills. It's important to believe and understand that this is a skill that can be learned and it can be trained and, and it can be strengthened just like you go to the gym and you start lifting weights and you build up your muscles and all of a sudden you can go from you know curling five pounds or doing five pound bicep reps to doing 25 pound bicep reps um, and so it's not this is not something that you um, practice one or two times and then your levels of resilience increase it's it's the daily habits and the daily ways that we practice these skills that in the long run, your levels of resilience are going to increase. And that's the same for organizations and, and companies as well. Now, I will say that, that there are different um, characteristics or different ways to boost resilience for organizations. And But today I'm going to be focused on the individual resilience. So in today's presentation, I'm going to give you a framework, kind of a metaphor for you to conceptualize resilience. that You can kind of easily come back to every day. It's, it is a touch point to start thinking about resilience. We're going to cover the four C's, which are control, challenge, cope, and confidence. And then under each one of those C's, I will provide some strategies and tools for you to be able to put into action and practice to build your capacity to cope with stress and adversity. So the, the, the framework, um, I, I love this metaphor because it is, it is something that we can, we can all relate to. You thinking about yourself as the captain of a ship. And you are navigating life. When a, when a captain sets out to sail, he has a destination, he has a goal, he or she has a goal that they need to get to. And there are certain things that they have on the ship that help them be prepared for the journey. Um, and they are committed to getting to their destination. But the captain cannot control the weather. And so we are going to think about you as the captain and stress and adversity in life is the weather. And so resilience is all about how does the captain navigate the weather on the journey over, over the, the ocean as, as he's going around the world. So the, the first thing, and I already mentioned this, is that the captain cannot control the weather. There are lots of other things that the captain can, can control. He can control the route, um, the uh, tools and supplies, how much they packed. Um, they can control their attitude. They can control um, certain elements how many ports they stop at along the way, but they cannot control the weather. So the first C is focusing on controlling what you can control. So I want you to get out a piece of paper if you have one and on the, on, and split it up in, into two columns like I have on, on the screen. And I want you to brainstorm for a couple minutes in your work life. What are, what are the things that you can control and what are the things that you cannot control? And then in life, same thing. What are the things that you can control and what are the things that you can't control?
All right. And if anyone wants to, to share some examples of things that they cannot control in either work or life, uh, that let's, I would be curious to, to hear what some of your answers are. Other people, absolutely. As much as we want to. It would be so much easier if they just did what we wanted them to, right? Um, cannot control employee transitions, absolutely. Others' reactions, their attitudes, their opinions, their actions. Christina, absolutely. Other people's feelings towards you or their opinions about you. Ooh, the future. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Their performance. Nope, nope, we can't control the weather or traffic. Can't control our kids, our spouse. Okay. The economy. Excellent. Oh, changes in the law. What are, what are some things that are within your control? Attitude, yes. How you respond, time management, showing up, being present. Oh yeah, the get to versus have to attitude. Uh, your fitness, yep. Creating boundaries, excellent. What you eat and what you do, yeah. And so generally, how do you, is there a difference? And if so, what are some differences between how you feel when you focus on what you can control versus what you can't control? Jamie says, happier. Yeah. Uh, there's peace. Mm -hmm. Empowered. Relieved. More of a purpose in your life. Uh, Isabel says less internal conflict, less helpless. Absolutely, that's a great one. Empowered, yes. So when, when we shift from that others focused, we generally feel more stressed. We generally feel more anxious, more helpless. And, and so you guys are spot on that when we focus on what we can control, it is energizing, it's empowering. There's more inner peace because we are letting go of trying to control the situation and control other people, which brings us stress and anxiety. And so first question, when you face a, a stressor or a, a problem or something that's not going your way, thinking about what can I control? What is within my control? and then relentlessly letting go of the rest. When you can do that, and when you are focused on yourself and what is in your control, then that, that emotional experience of being more empowered and feeling more of a sense of purpose is a result. If the, and, and the challenge, part of the challenge is this word of accepting. We may not like what is happening. The captain may not like that there is a storm on the horizon, but as soon as, as we start to resist and fight against reality and what is going on, that is what creates more stress and more suffering. If we can accept that it's happening, even if we don't like it, then that reduces the suffering and puts us in a position to be able to handle the events in a much, be much better uh, mindset. So that's the first C. The next one is related to the, the captain's thoughts. So this is, this is also related to the idea of control, um, but it's just in general how we think about things. And I talk a lot about mindset in my work with my clients and organizations because our mindset is truly our perception of the world and how we believe we fit into the world and how others are 
and, and how we see others. Our brains are meaning-making machines, and so it's constantly interpreting what's happening, what's going on, and making stories out of it. We have a certain set of patterns of thoughts and beliefs that are hardwired into us because you've been practicing thinking that way for so many years and they, they live in your subconscious. And that's a survival mechanism. There's too much information to process at a, at a, ref, at a slow pace and reflect on things. So your brain creates shortcuts to be able to process all the information, make decisions and move forward quickly in life. Um, so 95% of your actions and your behaviors each day are driven by these beliefs that are living in your subconscious and only about 5% of your actions and decisions each day are made with, with kind of the, the, the conscious mind. So, the you can change your thoughts and your beliefs it takes awareness and it takes practice but it's very important that if you have a if you, if you think you have lower levels of resilience it, i examining getting out a a magnifying glass and paying attention and asking and being curious about how am i thinking about this event what is this story that i'm telling myself is going to be a fantastic tool in your toolbox. Through the power of neuroplasticity, we have the ability to change our thoughts and beliefs. Just because we think something doesn't mean that it's true. Just because we feel something doesn't mean that it's true. So we need, we need to consistently be examining our thoughts and examining them for, for truth or asking if they are helping us and working in our favor? Or is there another way to be thinking about this event that is going to be more helpful? And one of these is to change looking at challenges or looking at obstacles and stressors and adversity from obstacles as, from, as a threat to a challenge. So one of the you know, if the captain is looking at a storm on the horizon and he or she is thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to get through that storm. I'm probably going to die. He, they're, they're interpreting this as a major threat to their survival, which that storm may be, but interpreting it that way is going to raise their stress levels. And depending on that captain's levels of resilience, he or she might just want to avoid it or they don't have a lot of belief in their ability to navigate the storm. So they may not put, a, put, in, put in as much effort. And then as a result, something major might happen. They, the, the ship might actually crash. So when we switch it from, okay, this is a threat, which anytime your, your mind is interpreting something as a threat, your stress response goes off. That fight or flight response goes off because that is literally what your brain is designed to do, is to look at things as threats and determine if we need to um, go into fight or flight mode. When we look at something as a challenge, we see it as I can deal with that event. I may learn from that event. There's a little bit of excitement of, hmm, how exactly am I going to get through this storm? It opens up flexibility. It opens up use, looking for tools and resources. Um, and people generally like to accomplish challenges. Uh, if, if you work with a lot of professionals, I'm, I'm sure you all work in various types of organizations, um, but generally high achieving professionals, competitive people, we like to face a challenge and have the satisfaction of overcoming it, the satisfaction of solving it. So having a challenge, like solving a puzzle, kind of excites us. It motivates us to move towards the problem rather than away from the story. Woo, this is going to make a, a good story. So that's, that is a, a good reframe right there. So the, the benefits, like I said, it, it changes your stress response in the body. So there, there is a, a body of research that shows 
that how we think about the stress event changes the physical response in our body. And one of the challenging parts about being an HR is the, the number of stressors and stress that you deal with all day, every day. And when we don't release the stress, when we don't deal with the stress well, it stays stored in our body. And that is what leads to a host of physical and mental health issues. And so the more tools that we have to be able to turn off that fight or flight response or to reduce the amount of cortisol that is produced in our body, then the healthier we will be. Thinking about something as a terrible event, I'm in danger, automatically releases that cascade of stress hormones and cortisol and adrenaline through your body versus, okay, how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to get through this? That does not release the cortisol and the stress hormones. So this is an excellent way to change a physical response in your body. And then, as I said before, it increases our motivation to move us towards the problems rather than wanting to avoid the problems. And as in, in HR, I'm sure you've had the experience of, you know, people coming to you and they have a, they have a big problem. And you look at this problem and you think, this could have been dealt with three months ago if you didn't put your head in, in, in the sand and avoid it. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of a long-term benefit to being able to face problems and challenges head on. And then this, the second C is how we cope with adversity. Now, is the captain at the wheel, at the helm of the ship, actively dealing with the situation? Or is the captain under, in the bunker, drinking some rum, avoiding and numbing and, and, and trying to deny and pretend that reality isn't happening? So our coping strategies are, are an essential tool in our toolbox for how we navigate stress, how we release stress every day, how we recover from the stress and bolster our energy to be able to continue to sail the ship. As, as an, a professional, HR professional, it takes a lot of energy every day. When people are coming to you with problems, or people are coming to you with emotional situations in, in their lives or sensitive situations at work, you have to be empathetic. You have to be compassionate. You have to be um, kind of on, on the front lines of crises at times. And that takes a tremendous amount of energy. And so resilience and these coping strategies are designed for two things. One is, is to release the stress every day so that it's not storing in your body. And then two, bolster your energy and your capacity to handle stress. So we all have coping strategies, habits for how we deal with life. Some of them are healthy and some of them are unhealthy. And there's no judgment here. Um, we, we all have different ways of dealing. And I just encourage you to think about, is this habit, is this strategy that I've been practicing and maybe that I've learned from somewhere or someone over the years really serving me well or helping me have the best mental fitness, physical fitness, or is it harming me? Is it hurting me? So some standard unhealthy coping strategies that I see or that you may see either in yourself or in family members or employees are complaining and blaming. When, when people have an attitude of, you know, it's, it's someone else's fault or, um, you know, you're driving in traffic, which you can't control and you just start complaining about it. This is draining your energy and it's not changing anything about the situation. 
Um, at work, I'm sure you can think of circumstances where other people just want to point fingers and blame others, and that is not helpful. It's not moving the needle forward. And there's a difference between taking responsibility for your actions and needing someone to take responsibility for their actions and then complaining about the situation. Complaining just kind of adds suffering onto a situation that might not, not, might not be ideal. Um, we all have, have the tendency to want to escape at times. The biggest escape tool that we all have is our phone. Uh, you know, we, we kind of face something that makes us uncomfortable or we're, we're stressed out. And so it is a quick, easy strategy to pick up our phone and scroll for a while and get a dopamine boost to our brain and to change our emotional experience. We use our phone as an emotional regulation tool more than anything. Um, but it also helps us kind of escape into this, this other world of life. Um, different addictions are a way to numb and escape from what's happening. I put drinking alcohol on there as a, as a separate one because a lot of people will start drinking alcohol and not necessarily want to develop or intend to develop a, a daily drinking habit, but alcohol is a very effective stress management tool in the moment. It is designed as a drug to kind of take your nervous system offline. So you get that immediate release or relief from the feelings of the stress in your body. Um, but then it causes the next day, the drug in your body causes more anxiety and depression. And then because you're feeling more anxious, then you're like, oh, I want to drink. It's because you know that, that the alcohol is going to... Um, release or give you relief from the anxiety. And that's how the, the drug works as a mechanism. Um, so that's why I highlighted that separately because it, it can feel like a very effective and helpful strategy in the moment. It's a Band-Aid in the long term, alcohol just causes more health and mental health issues. Um, so be, be very mindful of drinking habits, denial, anger, we can't expect ourselves to not get angry, but when we stay in a place of anger, it's the, if the captain is angry about the weather, it is you are not thinking with your rational mind. When you are angry, you're thinking with your emotional mind. So the executive command center in your brain is not in charge. And that that is what helps you approach things with a problem solving mentality. Uh, Procrastination can be an unhealthy coping strategy. Oh, I don't want to deal with this. This seems like too much. So I'm just going to put it off, avoid it, and procrastinate on the problem. Over and under eating are, are also coping strategies, isolating and withdrawing. And then when we catastrophize the situation, when the mind just to gets, gets to run free and think about all of the negative future events that are going to happen because of this stressor right here in this moment, when we don't actually know that those things are going to happen. So we want to build our toolbox of healthy coping strategies. Practicing these things, this is not an exhaustive list. The good news about healthy coping strategies are there is there are a, a lot of them. Um, and you get to pick what works for you. For one person, a coping strategy of going out in their garden and weeding is, is something that they love. It's a very mindful activity. It's, it's physical. And for other people, that sounds horrible. That sounds like a really <laughs> bad time. Um, so you get to pick what works for you. Um, time in nature is a great way to... Reduce stress, we automatically feel more calm when we're in nature. And this doesn't have to be going into the forest. This can be as simple as going outside at, a, at your office on a break and looking at the clouds or looking at trees if you have some, some around or getting some plants for your office and, and putting them in there. We're, we're naturally grounded when we're in nature. Seeking social support, your social community, your connection to other people is a huge bolster to your resilience. We are not meant to go through this life alone. And when there are problems and we have other people who can rally around us and support us, we have more of a belief 
that we can get through this. And that's one of your roles in HR is you are that support system for people. You are the people that are going, I'm going to help you get through this. So it's important that you have your own support network in your personal life and your professional life. And joining a group like this is an excellent example of having your own professional support system. And then engaging with creative activities. This could be cooking, this could be art. You don't even have to be good at it. Listening to music. These, these types of activities release stress, help your brain process what's happened and learn from it um, and, and engage other parts of your brain. Healthy emotional expression, journaling, um, talking to friends, resting. Someone mentioned before that it's important to recognize when you need to take a break. Rest is productive. Rest is necessary. We cannot be working doing machines 100% of the time or we will burn out. Um, engaging with hobbies, reading, sports, um, I'm curious while I'm kind of going over there, what or, or going over these, I'm, I'm curious, what are some of your go-to either hobbies or your favorite coping strategies? I'm curious and uh, your, your peers might get other ideas from you that I haven't shared on these slides. Spiritual support being connected either to uh, official um, organized religion or just even going out in nature and feeling a sense of being connected to a greater universe or the larger, you know, we are one tiny person in, in a giant universe helps boost our resilience and then practicing mindfulness. Um, reading, hiking, organizing. Organizing can certainly uh, reduce some, some stress. Walking, ooh, I love walking. Yoga, a good book. Reading is definitely one of my go-to uh, coping strategies. I read every single night before I go to sleep. Um, you uninstall all work-related apps. Excellent. It is, is important to disconnect from our phones and disconnect from work. When we're constantly scrolling too, we are not giving our brain a break from incoming stimuli. And one of the... One of the characteristics that we have to have with resilience is a problem solving mentality. Our brain is often continuing to process and think about and kind of chew on problems in the background. And this is why you have these aha light bulb moments as to what a solution is when you are in the shower or taking a walk because you've given your mind the mental space to be able to continue to um, process that problem. When we're constantly giving it stimuli, it does not have the space to do so. And then when we feel this pressure of always being on, that's very draining from an energy perspective. So giving yourself permission and taking the action to set the boundaries and disconnect from work is crucial. I like to pretend it's 1995, 1995 and we didn't have cell phones. When I'm at home in the evening, I will put my phone away in my room, out of my sight, and be present and, and live life. And it truly helps with that disconnection piece. Because when, our, when we can visually see our phone, our brain is still thinking about it, still kind of tethered to it and wondering if we've missed something or if someone sent us an email. And it really does not allow us to, to switch off from work. So I'm gonna have you practice two COVID strategies very quickly. Um, the first one is, you know, recognizing maybe when you are having a stress response, when you're feeling the tension, kind of the adrenaline and the cortisol, the deep breathing is a, a go-to strategy. Um, I, I imagine maybe you've, you've had some practices with this before. I'm probably not the first person who has told you that deep breathing is a strategy for reducing stress. Um, but sometimes people are like, nah, I don't really know if that works. And so um, I'm going to have you just do three deep breaths in through your nose, hold it for a count of two, and then exhale out your mouth for a count of six. So four, two, six. 
and do three of those and see if you notice any sort of release of physical tension from your body. To get, <clears throat> excuse me. So type a, a yes in the chat if you use deep breathing as a strategy or you can feel a difference in, in your body when, when you do that. The reason why this is effective from a, a mind and body perspective is because when, when we have that stress response in our mind, the emotion center is taking over and your brain is sending oxygen away from your brain to the extremities of your body because if you are going to run away from a lion you don't need to be thinking logically you need all of your power in your legs and in your hands so what deep breathing does is it actually gets oxygen back to your brain um, and shifts the command center from the emotional to the logical and it slows down the adrenaline and the cortisol and your heart rate and your breathing so physically you feel more calm which helps us assess the situation better. And Isabel says, yes, she feels a difference. So why don't I do it all the time, right? That's, that's the thing about these strategies is they're not, they're not hard to do. It is remembering to practice it. And we wanna practice these things when it's not a moment of stress and escalation because we wanna be trusting that these strategies are going to work and that they're going to be effective. When we're kind of in that panic mode, we don't want to be going like, oh, what was that breathing strategy I, I learned? Or is it going to work? No, we want to, we want to trust that it's it's going to. So, you know, different strategies, you could pair it with something that you already do. Like if you have coffee in the morning, practice taking three breaths in and out before you have your coffee. Same time with lunch, you know, habit stacking and pairing things with with habits that you already have can help integrate those into your life. Um, and then the next one I'm going to, I was going to have you do is, is the mental vacation, which I will save and we're going to come back to if I have time. Um, but I want to cover the other things first before we do that. Um, now, these are what I call my four daily foundational habits. These habits are what are really going to boost your energy. If you want better mental health, if you want a more positive attitude, if you want energy, these are the four things that are going to move the needle the most. I'm not saying these are easy, but they're the most effective. And I think you've probably, these are things that we logically know, but most of us have a challenging time doing. So the first one is sleep. Sleep is fundamental to every aspect of our physical and mental health. Uh, research shows that people, people who sleep seven to nine hours outperform their peers at work. It is associated with cognitive performance and memory and problem solving and information processing. It is related to our patience levels and our emotion levels. I know any of, the, of you who have kids know that when they are tired, they're more emotional, they're not as rational, and it's more challenging to get them to do anything. And we are no different as adults. Um, so prioritizing sleep is important. The next one is movement and exercise. If I could prescribe one thing to every single person in the world that would be more effective than medication or talk therapy or any other strategies, to help their mental health, it is exercise. And starting small, any sort of movement counts. A lot of people get caught up in the fact that they have to do a workout for 45 minutes and cardio and strength and seven days a week for it to count as exercise. And a 20 minute walk around your neighborhood every day is fantastic. Uh, movement and exercise, we are designed as humans for movement. If you think about how much our ancestors moved all day, every day. 
now we sit at a desk and have a very sedentary life. So what movement does is it gives your brain dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, endorphins, and this thing called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is associated with generating new neurons and neuro, um, kind of having neuroplasticity and keeping your brain healthy. So anytime you're feeling stressed, you know, do a little bit of movement in your office, do some yoga moves or do 10 push-ups, or just kind of get up and stretch and um, walk around the office. That would make a tremendous difference. Hydration. Um, a lot of us walk around dehydrated, but your brain is 85% water. And anytime it starts to get dehydrated, it is not in, in homeostasis. So it can't function optimally. And it actually triggers the fight or flight response. So anytime you feel a little bit anxious or on edge, try drinking a glass of water first and seeing if that, that helps. Um, so hydration is huge, especially in the summer. And then nutrition. And I did not change my icon there, but nutrition is important. There's, there are more and more studies coming out on the relationship between mental health and our nutrition and our diet. And a, for example, a person who eats the traditional Western diet of pizza and cheeseburgers and beer and French fries and bread and sugar and all the delicious things has a 50% um, higher chance of being depressed. So you want to think of food as fuel. Food, healthy food is designed to give us the vitamins and the minerals that we need for our body to be healthy, for all of our organs to work correctly, um, and to give us the energy that we need. That is what food is. It is to give us the energy that we need. So these four things are going to do more for you to boost your energy and your capacity to face the, the challenges and the stressors of everyday life at work and at home than anything else. And then the captain needs to be confident. That's the fourth C. So there has to be this underlying belief in our abilities to handle whatever life throws at us. Um, you know, I have a, a, an affirmation or a saying that I practice every day and that I have my clients practice, which is I can handle whatever comes my way today. You have to believe in that ability. You need to be committed to reaching your goals. When the captain sets out on the journey, he or she is committed to reaching the destination no matter what. The captain expects that there's going to be challenges. The captain expects that there's going to be weather. The captain expects that the journey is not going to be easy, but he or she is committed to doing whatever it takes to reach that goal. And then the... Um, Sorry, um, there, needs to have, there needs to be perseverance, um, this, this kind of unwavering mindset of we're going to get through this, and then there needs to be evidence that the captain can make it as well. So how do we boost our confidence in our abilities? Well, the first one is really transitioning from a pessimistic mindset to an optimistic mindset. Now, a pessimistic mindset, or an op sorry, an optimistic mindset does not mean that this is toxic positivity, as, as you hear out there, or everything is sunshine and roses, or it's, it's Pollyanna. No, optimism takes into account that there are going to be problems. An optimist will actively think about what problems that they could encounter so that they plan ahead if they can, and they have solutions prepared for how they would deal with those problems. There's a difference between catastrophizing an event and using your creative worry brain to be prepared and think about possible outcomes and say, okay, is that an outcome that I could be prepared for or I could solve? Yes, how would I solve it? No, I need to let it go. So the difference between a pessimistic mindset and an optimistic mindset, are, you know, the pessimism 
pessimistic person thinks that, you know, this is going to last forever. There's like a black cloud hanging over their life. An optimist knows that it's temporary. The captain knows that this storm is, is temporary. It's going to pass. Um, a pessimist thinks that a problem is pervasive, where an optimist thinks that it's just, it's temporary, it's local, it is narrowed down to this certain moment in time or this certain set of conditions. A pessimist tends to blame themselves and thinks it's all their fault. An optimist will take responsibility for their part in things, but then doesn't take it personally. It's not entirely their fault. And then the pessimist is really that helpless feeling. There's, there's nothing I can do about this. This is uncontrollable versus controlling the controllables. What do I have in my power to control? So being, being an optimist is going to bolster your resilience. If you tend to think on the pessimist side of things, I encourage you to think about, all right, if I flipped the coin over, what would be on the other side of this coin? What are some other options? What are different ways that I can think about this? Or how, what would I say to a friend? Even if we're a pessimist, we tend to talk to other people in a more positive, confident, encouraging way. So that's a great strategy to, to challenge your thoughts about a situation. And then here are um, four exercises that I'm going to cover, four psychological exercises that you can practice that are going to give you evidence that you can overcome challenges or solve problems or move through obstacles and signs of your success and then and, and bolster the dopamine in your brain. So the first one is practicing gratitude. Gratitude really rewires your brain because our brain is negatively biased anyways. Naturally, it will look for everything negative because that is what it is designed to do. So if you are only paying attention to the negative things that are going on in life, then you are going to be pretty miserable. But if you can tell your brain to pay attention to the positive things, then it starts to have a different um, sense of appreciation and possibility. So gratitude you can do kind of as a formal exercise if this is not something that you are familiar with where every night or morning you just think of three things that you are grateful for and nothing is too big to or nothing is too small to be grateful for. You know yesterday I went and gave a, a presentation and I was grateful that the technology hooked up the first time. You know there were no technical issues and so I had a moment of gratitude for that. So once you get in the mindset of gratitude and abundance you can start thinking of it in the moment but if it's new for you then you can make it a more structured exercise. And then the three good things exercise is um, by Dr. Martin Sel Seligman who is the father of positive psychology and it is at the end of the day, or maybe even at the end of the workday, you look back and you reflect on three things that went well that day and why they went well. What was your contribution to why those things went well? Were, were you persistent? Were you, did you have good communication about a problem? Were you creative? Were you supportive? Um, and so this just helps you build your list of and, and start to internalize your belief about your abilities and build your confidence that you can can handle whatever comes your way in life. And then the next exercise you can do is signs of success or self-congratulations. Oftentimes we are just so focused on getting work done that even if we do something you know, that we would give someone else a pat on the back for or a thank you or an appreciation. We believe I don't have time for that. And we just go on to the next fire that needs to be put out. But, but what happens when you give yourself appreciation and you're like, thank you, Emily, for um, getting that email sent out that's been on your to-do list for a couple of days. I really appreciate you getting that done. Is you're releasing dopamine in, in your brain and in your body, just like if someone else gave you a compliment or appreciation, that releases dopamine. So you can control and influence how much dopamine you have and how much um, 
of, of the positive feeling that you have. And dopamine is associated with motivation and focus. So if you ever need a motivation boost, start giving yourself high fives and, and thanking yourself for the things that you have gotten accomplished. Um, and this just starts to build your inventory and your signs of success over the years. And then the last one is savoring the positive. So when the captain has good weather on their journey, being appreciative of it, savoring the moment, really soaking in the calm seas and the sun, bolster resilience, because it helps remind us that not everything in life is negative. And it allows us to savor and um, soak in those feelings of joy or happiness. Um, and it, it takes three positive experience to outweigh one negative experience. Three compliments or five compliments to outweigh one negative criticism. And so we need to be training our brain to be focusing on the good things and soaking in when you are having nice moments. If you're out in the, the, the park and maybe your kids are playing or maybe you're there by yourself and it's just calm and peaceful or you see your kids having fun, savor that moment rather than uh, letting, letting it go by and you're mentally thinking about your to-do list as well. So these are, these are um, four exercises that you can practice every day. I'm not saying you need to do them all every day, but pick one. Pick one that you wanna start practicing, practice it for a couple of weeks and just start to notice what effects this has on you. And it has on your um, overall levels of mental health and mental fitness. So today we have learned um, that resilience is it's tied to our overall levels of individual and organizational well-being. Resilience is physical health and mental health. It's these these two things are tied together. Um, we've learned to conceptualize adversity as the weather, and as the captain of our, of our ship, how are we going to navigate the weather in life? And then what the four C's of resilience are and strategies to practice each of these psychological skills. So controlling the controllables, reframing threats as challenges, or reframing problems as challenges to overcome, focusing on adaptive and healthy coping strategies, and then bolstering your confidence and your belief in your ability to handle the stressors in life. And then again, practice and practice and practice. These are all skills. They aren't going to come, you know, um, if you practice movement for a week and then you give up, then it's, you aren't gonna have the benefits. Or if you practice gratitude for a couple days and you're not seeing a, a change, then you just haven't given it enough time. So physical health and mental health are the same. If we, want, if we want healthy bodies, we need to move our body and eat well every single day. If we want healthy minds, we need to practice these skills every single day. And there's, there's no end destination point for these psychological skills. So does anyone in the, I know we're at 12 o'clock, so I'm respectful of everyone's time, um, but I have a few minutes to hang out. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask me in the chat or send me an email. My email and my contact information is listed on, on this screen. Um, but I really just appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. And I hope that it was helpful. Um, and I'm always curious to ask people at the end of presentations, what is one thing, just one thing, that you are going to start putting into practice that you've taken away from today's presentation as a like, oh, I can do that. So if you'd like to share that in the chat, I would love to hear that answer from you. Hydration, yes. Um, 
excellent, awesome. Gratitude. There's an excellent TED talk by a, a monk, I believe on, on gratitude. So if you just Google gratitude TED, TED talk, it, it'll probably be the, the most highest watched is by a Benedictine monk. Uh, so I highly recommend reading or watching that. Reframing, reframing is such a powerful tool and one that's in your control. We can't control the thoughts that come into our mind, but we can control, do we listen to it or how do I respond to it or can I change it? And gratitude, great. Well, Emily, I can definitely say we are grateful for you. Thank you so much for all of this wonderful information, for the resources, for things that we can do right now and walk away with to really help with our own resilience. Thank you again uh, for such a great presentation. Thank you everybody else for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. I hope that everybody has a great rest of your day. Bye everybody.